It's going to be a great show. Welcome to the Practical Pistol Show, guys. My name is Ben, here to answer your shooting questions. we got Mr. Matt Hopkins. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Look at Matt's high-quality camera. I don't know how much of this is going to like carry to YouTube, but you look... Sick. I Good. see every... I can count the pores yep. on you. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. There's one pour, two pours, three pours. Man. And Mr. It's a, Nick. It's camera on a... Anyway. It's a surface. Those are pretty spendy tablets, right? Yeah, it's real nice. Is it that one you can like... It's that, that's the graphic design one with the pen? Yeah, you can write on it, like uh, do Photoshop and stuff like that. <sighs> They're paying you way too much at CZ, huh? Not mine. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All right. Before we get started, i got to give a shout-out. Uh, so I'm holding here a book. Uh, you guys don't know this, but I have a class organizer in Florida. His name's Ken. I call him Special K. You know Ken Verderame? You know that guy? Don't know him, no. He posts like crazy on the internet. But anyway, he sent me a book that he wrote about training for Steel Challenge. I've had it for a couple months, read through it. It's, it's interesting if you're going to train for Steel Challenge. There's a lot of uh, specific drills in here for it. So I don't know. You can find it on Amazon if you're interested in that. I thought I'd give him a shout out because you know what? He's a nice guy. He's the uh, he's the guy who came up with the banners for Steel Challenge training for the dry training. Is that ringing a okay. bell, Matt? Yeah, we talked about that once. Yeah. So, shout out to him. If that's something you're interested in, I don't know. Check What's it the name out on of Amazon. It? What's the name of it? Do you feel the need for speed? Is what it says on the cover. I actually Does it really? <laughs> yeah. Let me get the proper title. <laughs> While you're shouting them out, you probably Clickety should. clack. Well, I don't know if this is a pre-production thing or not. It's called Do You Feel the Need for Speed? A Training Manual for Becoming a Steel Challenge Grandmaster. Published October 7th of 2017. It's on Prime for $25. There's no digital option as of yet. Maybe he'll do that. I don't know. It's a lot of work to do the shit in digital, though. That's why I have some dude in India do it for me. <laughs> anyway, let's get to the questions because that's what people like. Ben, Area 8 was my first major match, and I noticed I was tired at the end of the day. I'm assuming that an overall general fitness level will help with match performance. On top of general fitness, I was wondering if the panel had any shooting sp specific fitness tips or areas that would help with match performance. For example, I've heard you mention that you do a lot of pull-ups, which I assume helps with grip strength. Agility drills might help with footwork getting into and out of shooting positions. Squat should help with shooting out of low pores. Since I'm working out anyway, my goal is to include any shooting-related areas to minimize fitness-related factors in match re performance. Okay, Nick. I don't mean to sound... Gay, but you've come up. You've you've become up a lot in the last eighteen months. I mean, physically. You know what uh, I'm saying? Well, I'm kind of on the way back to being fat right now. But well, I didn't want to say uh, anything, but yeah. Yeah. So, I've <clears throat> to, to generally answer his question, um, I got to say no. I, I I haven't found anything specifically other than you know I like the grip strength, uh, the grippers. I know not everybody does. You know, whether into that or not is fine. But in terms of anything else, in terms of general fitness, I think just being generally fit is better than not. So whatever that is, I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's, you know, going to be necessarily, you know, the determining factor in whether you're going to be successful here. Because I think, you know, we, we see people, you know, all different fitness levels compete at a high level. Um, I think fitter is better uh, under, you know, whatever circumstances may exist for you. So just general fitness, the, the better you are in terms of like cardiovascular fitness, I think that's going to probably keep you less tired at the end of the day. Um, when I was down in weight earlier this year, I did notice that I was less tired at the end of the day. Did that always translate to better shooting? You know, not necessarily that I can tell you right offhand, but it was still better overall. You know, I, I would prefer that versus, you know, not being, versus being tired, obviously. So. I think it's a factor. I think it's good to be fit. Uh, so if you if you want to do that, I think it's it's definitely a good thing. Okay. Um, 
I want to address this question in two parts and then see what Matt has to say. The first part, as far as the match, like at the match, it's a hot day. You want to be okay. I think as important as being physically fit, I'm not super fit, but what I do take pretty seriously is my, my diet and sort of my self-care at a match. So it's like drinking lots of water, drinking fluids. You kind of start the day before on drinking stuff and getting yourself hydrated. Then you're nibbling on stuff that's good for you to nibble on during the day. I don't go eat a big lunch or any kind of shit like that. You just nibble the whole day. Kind of uh, one thing that I have to tell myself to do a lot is a lot of times you're, you're antsy at a match or maybe you're hanging out with your friends. You're, you're walking around, you know, fucking chatting them up the whole day and you're not paying attention to it's like, hey, if you don't have to reset anything or let's say that something's fucked up on the stage and they got to shut it down for a couple minutes and fix something, just sit down. Just sit down and chill out for a minute and kind of pace yourself for the day. Continue to drink fluids, nibble on things that are good to, to chew on, like nuts, granola, a little bit of fruit, things like that. Things that are not good to eat, Skittles, M&Ms stuff with a lot of sugar in it because you're going <laughs> to crash from that. So like eat just a little bit of stuff that's going to give you a little bit of energy. Don't eat lots of heavy stuff. That should be pretty obvious. But you're, like how you manage yourself during the day is going to be as important as sort of how fit you are. As far as fitness, well, as this guy points out, pretty much if I do pull-ups, then I get stronger. And if I'm more agile, then that's good. And then if I'm thinner, that's cool too. And so, yes, being more physically fit in pretty much any way is going to help you. And one thing that may not be super obvious to people is being more flexible. I know it sounds a little gay, but uh, being more flexible is a good thing. I mean, it makes awkward positions far easier to deal with. And that's something that you're going to, you know, deal with pretty commonly, especially if you're shooting international matches, you know, being flexible is cool. So yeah, I mean, there's really nothing you can do as far as physical fitness. That's like a bad thing to do. Like, yeah, I mean, losing weight, being more fit, being stronger. Yeah. That's, that's good stuff to do. Do you have to do that? No, but uh, yeah, anything you do is going to help. So, you know, more power to you, buddy. Matt, you got any comments on that? I don't really have anything to add except for, you know, maintain what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Don't change drastically on match day you'll notice a decline in performance if you do that if you drink a gallon of tea in the morning drink a gallon of tea when you shoot the match you know don't don't just change i feel like that was directed at someone but i'm not <laughs> sure who i don't know i don't yeah. drink a gallon of tea i do i drink okay. i drink black i drink unsweetened black tea literally by the gallon <laughs> like i buy gallon containers of it and drink them so, well, maybe I should have said a gallon of milk then. You don't <laughs> want to drink a gallon of milk. Well, I mean, it's a free world. All sorts of bad things happen when you start <laughs> doing that. <laughs> All right, let's get to the next question. Why is it that short step reloads seem to be harder to consistently perform at a match compared to full out running reloads? I figure it's because I switch focus to the next target too early I assume he means on these short step reloads, but I wanted the panel's take on it. Keep up the good work. I really enjoy your podcast. All right, Matt, do you agree with the premise of the question that it is easier to do a reload like at a run as opposed to doing it in one step or two steps? As far um, as the no. percentage of them that you fuck up. Well, yeah, it's because you're not thinking about them. So what's the solution? If you, only, if you only have one step to do a reload, that's all you're really thinking about. You're not thinking about the movement between the positions. So when you do the long movement, you don't have to think about it, and you're just subconsciously doing it. But when you're not, that's when you mess up. How about this? Have you ever, do you ever feel like it's easier to do a reload in a couple steps as opposed to standing still, like on a classifier? Yes. Yeah. I feel that way too. I think it's exactly what this guy's talking about where it's like you want to like be done with the reload so bad that you like switch your focus. It's like you think, oh, reload. You look, oh, I'm done with that now. And you start looking up at the targets way too early. Yeah. Nick, what do you think about that? I think it's just a ratio of what percentage 
of you know what what are you focusing on or what's the hardest thing you have to do right now is it is it run because we're all pretty good at running we've been doing it you know our whole lives we do it every day if you have to reload in a short space you know reloading's harder than running so if you, if you have to reload and not move you're going to screw up the reload more often than you're going to screw up running okay i mean that's kind of my thought on it. when you're doing a reload running you have all kinds of time and space to fix it if you screw it up so you know you don't have that that uh, going on when you have a one step reload or a you know no step standing reload so you know just the fact that you have time to to, to unscrew it up on the run means that uh, I think you're going to execute it in the time needed on the run more more often than you are uh, going to when you're standing still. So what's the what's the solution for this so uh, couple step reload thing? If that's a problem. Well, I mean, I think it, it's really just, I mean, just the obvious point is, is dry fire. I mean, you're going to have to work on executing reloads, either standing or with one step consistently, um, you know, from all your pouches uh, in dry fire. I, I don't know what else to say on that. I mean, you're, that's just a pure question of what's your reload consistency level and making sure you're improving that. And making sure that he keeps his attention on his gun until he gets it loaded. You yeah. Know? Not being in such a hurry to like put the gun back on target yeah. and start shooting. Yeah. All right. Let's do another question. That sound good to you, Matt? Yeah, I'm ready. On my screen, I blew up your face really big. Did you? Yeah. It's obnoxious. <laughs> so that's what's going to... Oh, great. It looks good. No, it won't look like that on the YouTube channel. Just on my right. screen right now as it records it. Look, I see your face so clearly. It might look that good on YouTube. Yeah, I don't know. My I don't know what I did differently. Like all I did was plug the mic in after I turned on Skype. That might be it. it. Might be your Skype setting that it's like detecting a ton of bandwidth, so it's streaming up really high quality video. That's true. Yeah, at high upload speed, it may just be automatically calibrating your video quality. Good evening, Ben and crew. It's actually not evening. This is the first time in a long time, but we're recording in the afternoon on New Year's Day. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> a little bit of inside baseball. I'm leaving for like a month, so we need uh, to fucking spool up some podcasts here. Anyway, I'm working on my winter dry fire practice. It turns out I'll need to have arthroscopic surgery on my left shoulder at the end of January. Based on having had the same procedure on my right shoulder a few years ago, this is not a lucky guy. Oh, my God. It will take at least a month to get any reasonable movement back. How much work should I put into my dry fire between now and then if I'm going to be down for a month? Thanks, and I look forward to everyone's feedback except Juan Six because he's had me chart everything before and after and run a comparative analysis between the before and after. Just kidding, mostly. I don't think he's kidding. I think Hansik would have you do that. He's a real bastard. What would you... Okay, you guys tell me what you think about this. My feeling is hit it like as hard as possible. For the next month you know i don't know i don't know what he's going to be able to do with his right uh with his right shoulder um like i don't i don't know what that looks like as far as i mean for if, if this is me since i have a mark 7 press i'd be thinking i'm going to do a bunch of dry fire a bunch of physical shit in january like get really wore out with it and then in february when I'm laid up from the surgery, I'd be loading my ammunition. Basically like one-handed, you know, running the press and all that shit. That'd be what I'd want to do, you know? I don't know if this guy's an auto drive press or if he's right or left-handed or anything like that, but like, what does that plan sound like to you, Nick? Does that sound good? Well, I mean, I don't think there's a downside in doing that. I, I was gonna go a little bit different direction and just say, you know, considering how perishable skill, you know, all these movements can be when you're down. I mean, if you, if you, I think if you slam it super hard in January in terms of dry fire, you're probably going to lose whatever edge you've created during the time your surgery is down. So I'd probably, personally, my thought would be I'm probably going to be more in maintenance mode uh, in January, you know, doing some dry fire or whatnot. Um, and then just seeing where I'm at and trying to, to get back to top level, you know, as I'm physically able coming out of surgery. So, um, yeah, you know, I don't think it's a downside to, to training hard in January, but I don't know that it's going to help you a lot coming out of the other side of surgery when you can, if you can't really dry fire for a month or whatever. So, 
Man. That went a different direction than I anticipated. <laughs> yeah. You, you'd be going for a new high in January and then. So yeah. That carries over. Yeah. That might, could be. Like I said, I don't think it's a downside, but uh, if I'm, for me, like when I, when I don't shoot for a while or whatever, for any reason, you know, I'm starting from kind of a certain baseline, you know, when I get back to it. And no matter what my previous kind of personal best was or whatever, I, I find that I'm kind of starting over from, you know, what I consider relatively low level. Um, it's kind of my personal experience with it. So. Matthew, sure, I think. Got an opinion. I think you should hit it probably not as hard as you can, but I think you should not stop practicing, and then just take the month of February off. Like he has to, and then hit it again hard. I'm all alone. <laughs> Tell this guy to get in there, get shredded. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think you're going to lose enough during that February. I think a month is a is long enough period of time to where you know, if you set some new personal records in January, you're probably just going to have to build right back up to them in March. But everybody's different all right well another bang up podcast guys thank you so much for coming on listener people if you have a question you'd like the answer to head to bensteger.com send me your question oh wait shit do you have any business shit to talk about let me check I don't think so um Back half of, or first half of 2018 is completely fucked up. So if you want to do a class in the first half of 2018, it's probably not going to happen. Second half of 2018, it's looking okay. Like there's some openings, uh, November, December type of stuff. If you have a climate that you can do classes in November and December and you want to you want to host one at your range, get in touch with me. Because uh, now's a good time to start setting that up for sure. All right, that's it. That's all I got. I have to make sure I, I have to shout out sometime. Fuck.